How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you, Lord. I thank you for this time we have together. And I just pray, Lord, that you bless it, that you speak to our hearts here this morning, Lord, Heavenly Father. And, uh, just challenge us and uh, encourage us, Lord, Heavenly Father. Convict us, Lord God. And uh, we just love you, Lord, and we praise you and we thank you for your precious son, Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, that you be magnified here today, Lord God, and um, that you just bless our hearts, Lord. And we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, today I'm going to be in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses uh, 7 through, I'll just start with 7 through 10. So Galatians 6, 7 through 10, it says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So, um, the one thing, I titled this message, Don't, don't Grow Weary, uh, they're based out of that uh, verse 9 where he says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. You know, sometimes whenever you're following God or living for God, you can grow. Weariness can come up sometimes, especially when you face the, uh, just, just facing uh, just people, the world, and just it don't seem like stuff. You know, you're just working for the Lord, doing all this stuff, and it just don't seem anything's coming of it. People can get weary inside, and that's what that that word weary, weariness there means. The actual biblical definition of it is to be negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weariness, and it, that's what it is. It's that you know I'm working for the Lord, kind of like I talked about last week. You know, with farming, you know, that's the, there's so much uh, in the Bible or just being a Christian that relates to farming, right? I'm plowing along, following after Jesus Christ, right? Plowing along, and it just seems like nothing's happening. I'm just going along, going along, working, 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 and there's nothing coming of it, and weariness can come from that. And and he's talking about farming. He, he kind of uses kind of a farming uh, word at you where he's saying, for he who sows to the flesh will the flesh reap corrupt, corruption, right? He's talking about farming. That, that we sow. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And um, the reason why Paul's saying this, uh, starting off in verse 7 where he says, Do not be deceived, is because if you go back to chapter 1, let me read it real quick. There in chapter 1, we'll see what's going on here. Paul says to the uh, Galatians there in chapter 1, verse 6, listen to what he says. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. Right, so there was a problem in Galatia or whatever that these people, Paul had already gave them the gospel. He's established this church, but as he's left or went on his way, these people have come in and started sowing some tares along the wheat, I guess you could say. And these people are starting to turn from the actual gospel that the true gospel that Paul's preached them, and they're starting to turn from it and fall into these, uh, uh, I guess you could say heresies and stuff. And what they were telling them is pretty much, I love what he says there. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Note that word mocked isn't like just mocking somebody. It's don't turn your nose up to God, right? And he says, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So what he's telling them is you can't just live how you want and expect God to bless it, I guess you could say, right? Because I'm and, and that's why he goes in to say, don't grow weary in doing good. These people are doing what they're supposed to do. And he's saying, look, don't grow weary in doing good. Because if you start to think that you can just, just because you don't see nothing good coming out of your goodness, doesn't mean that you can just start living how you want and think God's going to bless it or whatnot. Like, if, if you can kind of get to what I'm saying. Um, he says, uh. And, and that's what he's telling them here. He says, for whatever a man sows, that he'll reap. If you sow to the spirit of the spirit, you'll, re you'll uh, reap everlasting life. But if you sow to the flesh, right, you guess what? You're going to reap corruption is what he tells us. And, and we see that here. Uh, if you look over, he shows us what 
sowing to the flesh looks like. In uh, verse 19 of chapter 5, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish, amb selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, that's the sowing to the flesh part. And the reason why he's having to tell them this stuff is because what I believe is that people have come in and told them, like, look, you can know God and live how you want. There's people who think that. You see them all the time in church, or you might know people like that. They say, oh, I believe in Christ, but then they walk out to church and they live however they want. You cannot do that. There's no way. Like I always tell people, look, if, if you know Jesus Christ, that affects your whole life. Not just a part of it, not just a portion of it. It affects your entire life. And it does. There's no way that you can continue to just live like that. And that's why he's saying those who practice it, this is their lifestyle they live. He's saying you can't live a lifestyle like that and sit there and say, I'm saved. I love Jesus. No, you don't. Because your lifestyle, your lifestyle speaks contrary to what your profession is. It's just like if you... If some guy owned a big farm and he was like, yeah, I'm a hard-working farmer, man, I grow the best corn around, but you drive by his farm and all that's out there is thistles and thorns, right? You're lying to me. Your farm proves to me you ain't what you say you are. You might say you're a good farmer, but your field shows me you're not. And it's the same thing, it's the same thing with Christ. He affects our whole life, and he goes on, and that's, and see, he says, he says, for he who sows of the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows of the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now look, starting in verse 22 of chapter 5, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And, uh, and I love what he says there. If, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. And he says, because of that, he says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Um, so, so, like I said, I love what he says there about not growing weary while doing good. And like I said, whenever you get saved, that's the easy part. To, to me, getting saved isn't the hard part because... God does all that work, right? Salvation, the Bible just says if, that, if, if we just believe in the name of Jesus Christ, right, we'll be saved. We just believe in our heart. Believe, believe that he is the, the atonement for our sins, right, that he died on the cross, that he, that he uh, went to the grave, that he was raised from the dead, right? We believe in the gospel. Believe that Jesus Christ is a sacrifice for our sins, right? We believe that in our hearts. We, that's how we're saved. But then we grab onto that plow, right? You grab onto that gospel plow and you learn, like, look, there's a certain way. Jesus does command that there's a certain life that we have to live. We we do. And, and so we're going along plowing with God, right? We're yoked to Christ. Things get hard, right? It's not always easy living for Jesus Christ. It's not. The world's a hard place to live. I don't care if you're, I don't care if you know Christ or you don't, it's a hard place to live. Now, it's better to know Christ. To me, it makes it a little more easy because then I can at least have inner joy and peace and all that stuff. But when I'm when you're flying along with Christ, sometimes it gets hard and it gets and it gets tough. And that's why he's saying, "Look, I know you're going along, and what I'm telling you, this is good, but you're just getting weary because I don't see anything coming of what I'm doing. I keep doing good for you, Lord. I keep living for you. I'm loving you, but nothing ever seems to come of it." I just seem like I'm like a hamster on a wheel. I'm just spinning my wheels. But I'm tired and I'm weary because I'm because I'm working for you. And I don't see nothing going on for it. And I love what he says there. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. He says, look, in due season you will reap if you don't lose heart. That's why you gotta keep going. Even when you're tired and you get to the end of the field, guess what God tells you to do? Turn around and keep plowing back that way. And then when you get to the end. Just keep on going. And in the end, we will reap if we don't lose heart. That's why we can't lose heart. And I know I get weary sometimes. I know everyone else does too. 
It's something that goes with all of us. We face things in life sometimes that spiritually wear us out. They do. They will spiritually wear you out. They'll bring you down. They'll tear you down. But you've got to hold on to that gospel plow and just keep on plowing along with the Lord. You've got to keep going. And that's what he's telling them to do here. He says, look, don't grow weary while doing good. Um, because we're going to reap if we don't lose heart. And, and whenever I think about that plowing, I was thinking about this because, uh, you know, when I drive just around here, you drive around, you see the crop fields, and you see these farmers and their big tractors going along. And, you know, you go talk to that farmer, he'll be like, boy, I'm wore out. It's been a hard day of plowing. And I was thinking about this sitting at my house, just how different farming is from here to now. Like what we call hard work now, we would die if we was back then. You know, they was yoked behind an ox holding a plow and they had to walk behind it. And Yeah, the horse was doing a lot of the work and pulling, but you still had to control that thing. I mean, it took a lot of work to, to plow a field back then. And, uh, and I just think about that. You know, it takes a lot of work to be a Christian. It does. It, it's hard. I mean, it, you have to keep up with your relationship with Christ. It is something we have to constantly and consistently do to, to keep up with, uh, to keep our uh, relationship with Christ, I want to say, like vibrant and good and keep us feeling close and keep that peace and that joy flowing, right? We have to stay close to Jesus, and, and it takes work. It takes hard work. It takes, you know, prayer, reading the Word of God, being around Christians, right? We have to do those things. And sometimes, guess what? You don't feel like getting up and going to church. I know. I work all week. Sometimes I don't want to go to church. Sometimes I don't want to get up and read my Bible. Sometimes I don't want to have to study for a sermon or write a sermon. But guess what? It don't matter how I feel. It's what I have to do. I, you have to do it. It's just like back then where they, you know, nowadays we just give people food. I love that story in Ruth uh, that we was reading where those people, yeah, they left food out for the people to eat. But they had to go out and gather. They left the corners of their fields and people had to go out and gather their food. We, they didn't just hand it to them. You got to go get it. And, it's, and you know, if, if, if we looked at things like that and if life was like that today, imagine how different things would be. Where if you had to go work for your food, you would have to get up. It wouldn't matter how you felt. Oh, I'm sick. Yeah, but I still got to eat. I got to go do this stuff. And that's how it is with Christ. Like, I have to pray. I have to do those things. Like, and I know, and the reason, and it's, I'm not saying I have to do them like they're a law to me, but I know to keep up my relationship with Christ, to stay yoked and close to Jesus, I have to do those things. I have to spend time with him. I have to pray. I have to read his word. I have to study it. And I have to surround myself with people who do the same thing, with like-minded people. Because the moment that I get away from those things and I start, uh, it's easy for me to start getting super weary or get to start getting in my flesh and I'll start sowing the wrong things. And that's uh, why over in Job 4, 8, it says, even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And Malachi 1, 13, um, this is one of those deals here in Malachi. Listen to this. Malachi 1, 13, he says, you also say, Oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Now in Malachi, what he's saying there, these people were getting weary doing the right thing, right? And, and you see that, I didn't put, the, put it in here, but right after this, uh, right after verse 13 and 14, he says, he says, woe to you who have a good, you got a good heifer or a good lamb, that's good and you don't bring it, but you bring me these sick and lame offerings, right? They got to this point to where, hey, we're bringing these good offerings right now, and then they get to this point to where they're like, we can take these sick ones over here, save these ones for us, maybe get a better profit or whatever off of them. They're getting to that point to where they, um, where right and wrong, it didn't seem like it mattered, I guess you could say to them. Like this, they thought the same thing was coming from both. And that's where Paul's getting at with the uh, with the don't be deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you'll reap. Um, with is because so so often we're doing the right thing, and then it seems like, well, I can 
I can fudge over here and it don't seem like anything's happening. But guess what? God sees everything we do and, and everything that we sow, we will reap from it. We will. We're going to reap what we sow. That's why we have to be sowing good and we got to continually be doing good. We can't, we can't grow weary. We can't lose heart. Even though we do get tired, we can't lose heart. Psalm 126, 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing in sheaves with him. You see that? He says, he who goes along, he's sowing in tears. It's hard. This is hard, but I'm, but I'm going. I keep going. I'm weeping. I'm crying. I'm, I'm tore down. I'm broke down, but I keep going. And I love what he says there. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, Proverbs 11, 18 says, The wicked man does deceptive work, but he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. You see that? If you sow in righteousness, if you're doing right, you're going to have a sure reward. You might not ever even see it on this side of heaven. It might not be till you stand before God, but I guarantee you when he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant, and you see this, uh, and he puts that crown on your head, and he starts giving you the rewards from the work you did, you're going to be like, Man, that stuff was working. I was following Jesus, sowing righteousness constantly. Even though I was tired and I wanted to quit, I kept going. Look at this sure reward you got now. I mean, come on. There's going to be one coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Nothing we do is in vain. He says, keep on the well-doing. Romans 2, 6 and 7 says, Who will render, talking of God, he says, God will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immorality. That's what he says there. He says, he says that's he said that's one thing that's going to be rendered to you is eternal life. And it's only to those who by patient continuance and doing good. They, they continue to do good. They they keep going. They keep going forward with Jesus Christ, holding on to that plow, going along. 1 Peter 2.15 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see that? By doing good. Your goodness puts to, he says it will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And this is one thing that makes doing good hard right here. Especially for Christ. This verse here. Matthew 10.22 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the he who endures to the end will be saved. See, that's one of the things that make following Christ so hard is because it's not that people hate you. So many people can't stand Christianity or the thing or what Christianity stands for that this stuff, it falls on you. So it makes it hard sometimes when you're following Christ and people, they just hate you for no reason. It's like I'm just doing good out here, sowing righteousness, loving people, telling them how they can go from have an eternal life in hell to be able to have eternal life in heaven and these people hate me for it. They can't stand me. They come against you. They mock you. They'll talk bad of you. Right? And all you're trying to do is live for Christ. That'll weary your soul right there. And I think about people like that and think about Paul and Peter and these apostles, you know? And, the, and you read through the book of Acts them, they're just going along and they're and you can see their heart for the people that they were witnessing to. And these people just hate them. They beat them. They mocked them. Threw them in prison. And they just kept on going. How many of us have that kind of endurance? To face those things and be able to endure and keep going. Talk about not growing weary. That'd be a hard one right there. To just be like, man, I cannot handle this anymore. The pressure of this. But you've got to keep going. And that's what, and, uh, and that's what Paul tells you. His strength lies in Jesus Christ. That's where it is. He's so convinced in his faith that in Christ that he knows, look, at the end, I'm going to a mansion in heaven. I, what you do to me down here doesn't really matter. And when you can have that mindset, it changes the way that you live for Jesus Christ. Um, and in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give an offense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And I, you know, if, if you're living for Christ and you're holding on to that gospel cloud and you're suffering for it, notice what he says there. It's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Sometimes doing the right thing, you're going to suffer. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be fun. But you keep on going because like the verse says, at the end, you're going to reap a harvest. Your, your work's going to pay off at the end. And, and just, and, and like I said, keep going, keep moving. And the reason why is because God, because God sees us, right? In due season, we're going to reap that harvest. Matthew, I, I love this verse here in Matthew 15, 29 through 32. It says, it's of Jesus feeding the 4,000. But listen, listen to this. It says, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed who made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. You know, I read that verse and I think about being weary. Jesus knows what we need when we need it. Think about these people. They've been following Jesus for three days. And finally, at this point, it says he turned around and had compassion on them because he understood, look, they've been following after me for three days. These guys are hungry. They need some food. I don't want them to faint. I want them to be able to keep on going, right? When I send them, I want them to be able to go back home and not faint. It's the same with us. As you're going along with Christ, you feel weary, you feel tired, you feel like you're going to fall out. Look, he knows what you need, and he'll send what you need in due time. He will. Jesus sees everything that we go through. He knows our needs. The Bible says that he knows what we need before we even ask. But he calls us to ask. He wants us to have that relationship with him to ask. And, and you know, I know that kind of sounds um, dumb or like an oxymoron. It's like, why don't he just give me what I need then if he sees it? But I think of it with my kids. Have you ever watched your kids doing something and know what they needed? Or, or seen them doing but you're waiting on them to ask you. You want them to ask before you give it to them. You might see them doing something and know that, hey, I know what they need to do for me to help them, but you're waiting on them to ask you to come and help them, right? People, you do it sometimes, especially when you're training up a child, you have to do stuff like that sometimes. And it's the same thing with God. He knows what we need, but he wants us to come ask him, right? He wants us to come, he wants us to have that relationship with him. Leviticus 26, 3 and 4 says, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in this season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit. And Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14 says, And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in this season, and the early rain and latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. You see that? He's telling the Israelites there, he says, look, when you go in to possess this land that I'm giving you, he says, if you love me with all your heart, if you follow me with all your heart, he says, I'm going to take care of you. It's going to rain when it's supposed to. Thank I'm going to, everything, I'm going to supply all your needs. The Bible, um, there's a Bible verse that says, he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's somewhere, there's a scripture that says that. I don't have it written down in here, but I just thought about it. And God will. He'll support, he knows what we need, right? He watches over us. He protects us. And uh, Matthew 11, 28, 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look, going after Christ, it can get hard, it can get tiresome, but Jesus tells you, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I promise you, it's a whole lot easier and a whole lot lighter than that of the world. 
Look, if you're yoked to the world, there ain't nothing worse than that. You don't have joy. You don't have peace. You don't have the promise of eternal life with God in heaven. You don't have none of those things. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Um, you know, when I think about my life before Christ, I, when I was thinking about plowing, I thought, you ever watch them old westerns? And they always have that scene where the they're going through a drought or something. An old boy's out there plowing. He got that wooden plow, and it's like it's just dragging him along. He's wore out and beat up. That's how I look at my life before Christ. It's like I had this plow of the world that's just beat me to death, and there's nothing I could do. And then I, all of a sudden, somebody shared the gospel with me, and I trusted Jesus. I put, gave my heart and soul to Jesus Christ, and, and, I, and I always think about that, how much better my life is. Now, it hasn't been easy, it hasn't been a cakewalk, but it's a whole lot better than it was. Like, I have joy, I have peace, and it's things that the world could never offer me. And it's all because I grabbed a hold of that gospel plow and held on to it. And it's, that's how it is for all those who trust in Christ. And it goes back to this verse, Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. He says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints nor is weary? You see that? He says, God, he never faints. He's never weary. It says, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Listen to this. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know... I want you to think about this. Uh, just, just on thinking about plowing and farming and stuff like that. Think about this. Christ is the oxen, his word is the plow, and his gospel is the seed. Just think about that. That's that's what makes God so good, is, is, is he supplies everything we need. He supplies all of our needs. Everything we need, He supplies it for us. I don't have to go looking for it, searching for it. It's all right there in Jesus Christ, right? The seed, I don't have to go looking for seed. The Bible tells me it's the gospel. That's the seed. I don't have to go looking for the plow. I mean, His Word's the plow. That's what digs down and gets into people, right? That's what it is. That's what, when I think of plowing, a person plowing and planting, what's the plow? I think of that as the preaching, the sharing of the Word of God, because that's what gets down and breaks down a person's heart. If you don't have the Word of God, what do you got there to get down and break down the heart? The, gospel, the message of the gospel is what splits open a hard heart and opens it up for the seed of it to get in there and birth salvation. And that's what God supplied this stuff for us. And that's what's amazing. Yeah, it's hard to do the work, but He's supplying everything we need to do. He gives us every single thing we need to do the work. And yes, the work can be hard sometimes, but don't grow weary because we're going to reap a harvest. Isaiah 55, 10, 11 says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sin it. Look, God's word does never, it never turns, it never comes back void. It always accomplishes what its intended purpose is. And look, if you're out sowing righteousness and you're living for God, look, your life is not in vain. If you're not living your life in vain, it's not void. Look, there's going to be a harvest coming from it. Keep trusting God, keep living for him, and stay hold of Jesus Christ. Nothing we do for Christ is ever in vain. Nothing. Your life will never be wasted in Jesus Christ, I guarantee you. If you're living for Christ and you're holding on to Him, keep on doing it. I know it gets tiresome sometimes, you get weary, but trust, just keep trusting in Christ. You might not see a thousandfold harvest coming along behind you, but guess what? It's not in vain. Everything you do for Christ has purpose, it does, and God will use all of it. He does. There's so much thing, I think... There's so much stuff that we do for Christ that we don't see the effects of it until we get to heaven. We'll see the other side of it. I think some of us will be amazed and just think, man, I was just doing little bitty things 
that I never thought nothing about, but so many great things have came from it. And I'm telling you, that's why it's important. All we can do is live for Christ, leave the results up to Him. Remember that. It's His Word, it's His seed, and guess what? His Spirit will be the one to water it all and take care of that stuff. All we're there to do is just uh, we have to just stay true to the Scriptures, hold on, live for Christ, and plant the Gospel. Just cast the Gospel out there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I praise you. And I thank you, Lord God, that you do supply all, supply all of our needs, Lord Heavenly Father. You, you've given us everything we need to be successful Christians, to live for you, to glorify and honor your name. You give it to us all in Christ. And, um, we have your word, Lord Heavenly Father. We have the gospel message. You've even given us your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to lead us and guide us into all truth and righteousness. And I pray, Lord God, that... We just cling to your spirit, Lord Heavenly Father, that we that we trust you, Lord God. I pray that if we're not living right, or if there's anyone in here who's not saved, or anyone watches this that's not saved, Lord God, I pray that their hearts will be convicted, Lord Heavenly Father, and that they'll know, Lord, that they're a sinner and that they need you, Lord God. And uh, I pray that they'll turn from their sin and turn to Jesus. And um, I pray that you just bless all of us, watch over us, and if anybody in here is weary in their in their soul, Lord God, that that you will lift them up, Lord Heavenly Father, that you'll put some gas in their tank and um, just uh, encourage them along, Lord God. I love you, Lord. I praise you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.